never miss an update. And today we have very, very special guest with us. And he is none other than former ambassador from Japan to India, Mr. Yes. Hiravasi. Hiravasi right. san, welcome to the yeah. Nupur Tewari show. Okay. I spent in India as ambassador almost for five years. And since I quit the foreign service, I spent almost 15 years as president of Japan India Association. So my experience with India uh, is stretching almost for 20 years. is the last superpower. So we would yes. love to know why do you think so? Yes, there are two elements in my book. The first, India will become a superpower. Second, India will be the last superpower. India is qualified to become a superpower because of five most important elements. The number one, the size of the country. The population uh, reaching to 1.3 billion, maybe overpassing the population of China in maybe five years. Secondly, the size. Indian size is almost equivalent to the size of European Union. India is now having 28 states. European Union is having 27 states. The size of Europe and India are ident identical, except for the population. In terms of the population, India is much bigger than the European Union. Secondly, the strategic importance of India for two reasons. One is India is situated at the center of the European mass and faced with the three seas, uh, Bengal uh, uh, Bay, Indian Ocean and Arabian Sea. These seas are open to the traffic, maritime traffic to many countries, the countries of the East, countries of the West, even Africa. And secondly, India's strategic importance is in terms of China. China has been engaged in more and more uh, aggressive actions in the East China Sea, in the South China Sea, even around India, uh, pretending to establish, uh, how to say, one belt, one way. And if China is behaving as a peaceful nation, as a nation which is accommodating with many countries, there will be no problem. But all of us of Asia, even the United States, even the European Union are very concerned with the very aggressive strategy of Xi Jinping who even wants to equalize with the United States, even surpass the United States in the future. So the India is a sort of counterweight to China. Thirdly, India uh, is 
a credible military power with conventional weapons, with nuclear deterrence, but with democracy. The largest democracy is the nickname of India in terms of the voters number. The oldest democracy is the United States in terms of history. So all of us, Japan included, are having a confidence in India as a democratic country. Since the independence, India has never been experienced military coup d'etat. Never military regime like many countries in Southeast Asia, South Asia, the Philippines, the Indonesia, or Pakistan, many countries uh, in Asia and in other continents have had the experience of military regime. Even now, Thailand is governed by the cabinet, by the government, uh, influenced by the military. Let alone Myanmar. Myanmar is pure and simple a military regime. India has never experienced that. India has kept the tradition of democracy. Even Japan used to be a military power dominated the military before the Second World War. So India is one of the models of the democracy. Thirdly, India's global influence. Look at India's activities in the United Nations, in the non-alignment movements. Look at uh, the activities of non-resident Indians overseas. According to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan, it may be between 15 million to 20 million, even more than that. And the Vice President of the United States is half Indian. The former ambassador of the United States was former Indian lady. And uh, the dean of the uh, Harvard Business School, Microsoft and others are of Indian origin. In the United Kingdom, the same. So India is now uh, having the leaders around the globe who are doing excellent jobs for the international community. India's voice in the United Nations in other international organizations are well heard by the other countries, not like China, uh, not like Russia, not like even the United States. We have a sense of confidence in the Indian activities in the United Nations and other international organizations. Fourthly, India's long, long history of civilization and culture. India is one of the original four civilizations. Uh, in terms of the superpower, superpower should have some elements of cultural, uh, how to say, supremacy. India has just it, okay? And uh, finally, the number uh, five. India is developing in terms of economy and others. India is the number five. US, China, uh, uh, let's say uh, Russia, Japan, Germany. India has passed the United Kingdom. In terms of purchasing power, India is number three. After US, China, India, Japan comes to number four. We are surpassed by India in terms of purchasing power. 
So with these five elements in maybe five years, or maybe not, in 10 years or 15 years, India would become a superpower. It's my conviction. The second point is that why India is the last superpower? Yes, we would love to know. Yeah, there are many countries uh, which would become great powers. Maybe like Brazil, maybe Indonesia, maybe Egypt or South Africa. But they are lacking with some elements which I have enumerated in case of India. No military power in terms of uh, Brazil and Indonesia. Uh, they have, but uh, not military power which would be matching to the status of superpower. Cultural tradition, and luckily Brazil, Indonesia, they don't have long historical cultural tradition. Egypt maybe, Egypt maybe, but Egyptian population is much smaller. Okay, that, that is my reason that uh, why India would be the last superpower, superpower. So four superpowers of the globe, US, China, Russia, and India finish. Unluckily, Japan wouldn't become superpower. We are lacking some of the elements. We have cultural traditions, excellent uh, people, high education, economy, but we have no nuclear deterrence at our own uh, initiative will. Without nuclear deterrence, a country tends to be uh, pressured by a malicious countries, which would be threatening, if not the, by the use of power, but by the threat of power. China is almost doing that vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan, vis-a-vis -vis some of the Southeast Asian countries, Vietnam, Philippines, they are uh, doing a little bit much less, but doing the same, same, same kind of things to our uh, territory of Senkak Islands. So uh, unluckily or luckily, Japan would not become a superpower. Japan would remain a, a great, a big power, a respected power, but not superpower. So that is my argument. So that is one point Japan is lacking. Mm. Especially nuclear power. Nuclear power. Yeah. If Japan would have the nuclear power, Japan may be qualified as a candidate to the future superpower. Okay. But uh, with our own will, the people's will, we have renounced the possession of nuclear power. Of course, uh, we are depend depending on the United States, nuclear umbrella, nuclear deterrence of the United States uh, compensates that deficiency of the United States. Hmm. So uh, uh, the next, uh, I want to stress, what kind of problems India has to solve before becoming superpower? Okay, so okay. before, yes, uh, definitely we are going to know that um, what kind of problems we have to solve before becoming the superpower, but a little bit would love to know that what kind of experience you had during your time in India? Uh -huh. That's a very interesting period. Uh, I spent uh, a little bit less than five years. Mm -hmm. I arrived in March 1998, just okay. after the election of general election of the United States, 
uh, India's Lok Sabha. Lok Sabha, yes. Uh, BJP uh, had won the elections. Yes. They expressed uh, the hope mm -hmm. to resume nuclear experiments. Mm -hmm. I went to uh, India in March. The nuclear tests were conducted in May. So after uh, two, two months after my arrival, I was uh, sort of greeted, baptized by India's nuclear tests. But, uh, but as, a, uh, as an envoy of, the, uh, of Japan, I was obliged to lodge strong protest to the government of India. Mm -hmm. Japan uh, made several demarche approaches to India, mm -hmm. including the suspension of official development assistance. The first, with the first tests in Pokalam, yes. we suspended the grant assistance, which okay. was of minimal size. So no harm to India. I insisted with the then foreign secretary, our chief uh, secretary or prime minister, Vajipai, that please stop here. If you conduct further tests, my government would be obliged to take further actions. So please, please stop here. But they had already established uh, the plan to conduct the second series of India. So they didn't listen to me. They didn't listen to US, Australia, European Union, many other countries. So together with other countries, Japan was obliged to suspend a bigger portion of official development assistance, so-called yen loan. Amounting, uh, still, India is the largest recipient of yen loan on the globe now, partly because of the Shinkansen projects and others. Yes. But at the time of nuclear tests, we were obliged to suspend. I was asked by the Prime Minister Hashimoto, whom I served as his foreign policy advisor at the Prime Minister's office. He convened me to show a sense of protest to India. Okay. Uh, the government of Japan uh, convened the Indian ambassador uh, in Japan, Mr. Shin, to the foreign ministry and the others, the mutually. Uh, but uh, Hashimoto told me, uh, once I told everything about the nuclear tests, he told me uh, he was very nice to me. We are a sort of friends. Go back to India. You don't have to stay in Tokyo because you have done all you have to do. Uh, the explanation of nuclear tests and others. So now go back to India. You will be more useful in Delhi than in Tokyo. That's true. That's true. So I continued to, to work to restore the relations for two years. Okay, After, it extended. Yeah, uh, but before Japan, United States moved ahead. Just after the Pokalan II, they started so-called strategic dialogue between Indian external minister, Jaswant Singh, whom I, I knew very well, who uh, passed away recently, yes. and Strobe Talbot. I think he is the, uh, the chairman of uh, Brookings Institution, maybe. Uh, he was then uh, the deputy for uh, secretary of state. They were engaged in strategic dialogue. dialogue. The visit of Clinton and Madame Clinton were realized. They came up to the Indian parliament to deliver a speech. I attended the session. 
I was seated in the in the beach reserved to the foreign diplomats, looking down the uh, plenary session. Enthusiasm was so huge after the Clinton's address. All of the lawmakers, Lok Sabha, uh, uh, what uh, the other upper house senators, La, uh, uh, Raj Sabha, Lok Sabha, Raj Sabha and members, Raj Sabha, yes, both members, they were running to vis-a-vis -vis to Clinton to shake hands. Even they were running on the bench of uh, the seats, on, on the seats. They were running, looking down, it's a spectacle. I was uh, impressed that the restoration of diplomatic uh, uh, affairs would be so welcomed by India. So I suggested to the Japanese government and then to the Prime Minister Obuchi, who succeeded to Hashimoto, please come to India. Do like Mr. Clinton. He accepted. He organized, he wanted to organize a G7 meeting in Okinawa. Then at that time, G8 meeting, including Russia. But he passed away by the brain stroke. So Mr. Mori Yoshiro succeeded to him. He became the prime minister. And I asked Mori, whom I know since I was very young, in my, in my 30 years, I, I knew him, Mori, very well. He's the president of Japan India Association. I asked, uh, he, he's, he's, he said openly to the Japanese public, he succeeded mm -hmm. all of a sudden to mm -hmm. Obuchi. He promised to honor all the commitments made by Obuchi. So I told Mr. Mori, one of the commitment was for Mr. Obuchi to come to India. Will you honor this commitment or not? He said, yes. Like Obuchi, he knew the importance of information technology. He told me he wanted to go to, go to Bangalore, Bengaluru, hmm. and he came. He came in uh, August 2000 and met Mr. Vajpai. But before that, he went down to Karnataka uh, to meet the chief minister and others. Huge welcome, huge welcome. And then he went up to Delhi and both prime ministers signed a very important diplomatic document. <laughs> the title is the Japan-India Partnership. In Japan-India Global Partnership for 21st century. Why global? Uh, my suggestion was that India and Japan are big powers, great powers, respected powers. Both countries should not focus only on their own interests. We have to look out. We have to extend our resources, human resources, financial resources, and others to the less privileged countries in Asia, in South America, in Africa, and others. That's the global partnership. So it's an important declaration that Japan and India would become globally responsible power. Of course, on the bilateral fronts, there are so many projects, including Shinkansen and many others, uh, Delhi Metro project, or so many projects. But the global partnership is not limited to the bilateral benefits. Hmm. And then other prime ministers succeeded in India. Dr. Manmohan Singh became prime minister. Koizumi became Japanese prime minister. They added one more adjective, strategic. So the partnership became Japan-India strategic global partnership. 
And when came in Mr. Narendra Modi, Mr. Shinzo Abe was his partner. Shinzo Abe invited Mr. Modi to Kyoto. And after visiting Kyoto, uh, they organized a great banquet at the prime minister's office. I was there. Mr. Modi told us, told the audience, they agreed to add one more adjective, special. So now the relationship is uh, adapted with three adjectives, special, strategic, and global purpose. This is the only partnership in the world with three adjectives. According to Modi's explanation, why special? He stressed very strongly on the importance of the spiritual bond. Spiritual bond came from the Buddhist tradition. The Buddhism is, a, 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 in my view, a younger brother of Hinduism. They have so many common phenomena. So uh, common phenomena. No caste in the case of Buddhists, but many traits are common. So they agreed to put this word special. Really special me meaning a spiritual bond. So imagine what other uh, bilateral partnership have spiritual bond. Exactly. No, maybe not. Yeah, mean, no, I think only between yes, India, India and Japan. Uh, India, Russia. They have long history of partnership, but mm. no spiritual bond. Okay, so now uh, we are engaged in the spiritual, uh, special, strategic, and global partnership. Global. Then, so uh, yes. Here I have one question. Do yes. you think that Mr. Modi and Mr. Abe made this relation really very special than? Ever? Oh, yes. They are very close friends. Of course, before Abe Modi, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Mori was there. Mori is one of the most respected Japanese statesmen. Modi joke, jokes very often, even in face of Mr. Modi. You are Mr. Modi. I am Mr. Modi. Almost the same names. So they are getting together in a very amicable way. But Abe Modi relations is one step further. They pledged to create Shinkansen project. They agreed to develop Northeast India less developed part of India. For uh, long years, seven states of the northeast of India were left behind by the other states. Yes. The Modi suggested to Abe that you would engage in the development of northeast together with me. Japan is most qualified because Japan is highly respected in Myanmar. Even in Nagaland, in uh, Manipur, the Japanese uh, soldiers fought and perished together with the Indian National Army. Even now, the people of uh, Manipur, Nagaland, have high respects to the Japanese soldiers. Yes. They cooperated to collect the bones of the soldiers, even now, every year. So we are uh, having some affinity to these people. No, they, they, look, they look like us. If they wear <laughs> the Japanese uh, uh, things, you can tell yes. who is the Japanese, who is manipulated. No. 
So we have uh, some kind of uh, affinity. They do have. So India told Abe, let's go together and let's develop together and let's make uh, a connectivity projects which would link Northeast Asia to ASEAN through Myanmar. Now, India's linkage with ASEAN is only by sea, Chennai, Mekong Delta. If the connectivity is established between India and Myanmar, then from Myanmar, uh, it's very easy. Yes. I instead of this sea route, only relationship, India and ASEAN would be linked by this circular, uh, circular connectivity. That is a strategic design of Mr. Modi and Mr. Abe. In the last uh, uh, failed meeting between the two leaders should have uh, taken place in Assam. Yes. Assam. yes. Because of some uh, troubles in Assam, yes. uh, the idea was abandoned. Yes. But in Assam, they would have stressed the importance of this linkage, connectivity between North East India and ASEAN. Mm. So Abe is highly regarded. Now, Japan is engaged in the development of uh, Andaman Nicobar. Okay. In the Arabian Sea. Mm -hmm. Japan does not speak out loudly. That would offend uh, very much China. But strategic importance on uh, Andaman Nicobar to India, to Strait uh, of Malacca mm -hmm. is so important that we have to do something there to check the advance of China into the Indian Ocean. We couldn't do it by military means, but if Andaman Nicobar would be developed, would be having uh, some social or even military basis there, uh, that would be a huge strategic point to all of us. Now, these are the ideas of Modi and Abe. Uh, and not only the present Japanese government also taking those points forward? Of course. Okay. But not, not overtly. Huh? Not overtly. Huh? Mm -hmm. We are doing substantively. Okay. Uh, for the project. Okay. But uh, we don't like to provoke too much China. Mm -hmm. uh, India is having the same uh, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So you, you, know, you know this story of necklace of powers. Uh, necklace of Pearls strategy by, it's not uh, the naming of China, but some Americans, you know? Yeah. The uh, Myanmar's port, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka's, Ambantota, uh, Pakistan, uh, Guadal, if mm -hmm. they would be linked, it would make uh, a pearl. Mm. which is not decorated the neck of India, which is to squeeze yes. the neck of India. Exactly. That's why, uh, that comes the importance of Indo-Pacific strategy. Wow. This idea was initiated by Mr. Abe when he attended so-called TICAD in Kenya, Africa. TICAD mm -hmm. means Tokyo International uh, Conference for Development in Africa. Mm -hmm. Tokyo International Conference for Development in Africa. 
T-I-C-A-D, which started in the early 90s mm -hmm. by Japan. Then followed by China and others. Uh, the importance of Africa is going up. Then everybody is, is uh, catching this idea, but Japan was the initiator. So in the meeting, uh, in the summit meeting of TICAD in Kenya, uh, he uh, advanced the idea of Indo-Pacific cooperation. Okay. Japan, India should not be limited to bilateral relations. That is the gist of global partnership, no? as I have told you. Let's help Africa together. India has its own resources. India has a special historical relationship with East African countries, with South Asia. We don't have. Yes. But we have capital. We have technology. Combined with India's experience in Africa, we would be able to do much better mm. than otherwise. True. Uh, so uh, this way, uh, this way, Indo-Pacific idea is extending to Africa. <laughs> and uh, of course, the gist of Indo-Pacific strategy lies in uh, making this part of the globe safer and more prosperous. It's called open and free Indo-Pacific. It's not limited. Everybody, everybody is welcome. Yes. And uh, the four countries have agreed to form Quad for a party or, an, uh, or cooperation. US, mm -hmm. India, Australia, and Japan. But now, more recently, European Union is extremely interested. The last week, uh, five countries joined in the maritime exercise. US, India, America, uh, no, Australia, Japan, and France. In autumn, the UK will be sending its career, task force career into Indian Ocean to East Asia. Germany will be following. The Netherlands is interesting. Why wait? Uh, France for uh, long years says that they are partly Pacific power. Polynesia and uh, New Caledonia New Caledonia, they are a French territory. So they are the Pacific power. Faced with the Chinese uh, aggressive policy, they have decided to join the Quad activities by their own interests. True. UK is also having the Diego Garcia yes. in, in the notion. Of course, uh, the Commonwealth covers many Asian countries. True. Malaysia, Singapore, Canada, Australia, and others. So the UK is also a sort of Pacific power. Holland True. has the tradition of as colonial power vis-a-vis -vis Indonesia. So these countries uh, have some interests with Asia or in the larger context, Indo-Pacific strategy. This is the most recent development. Of course, China is frustrated. But of course. Uh, if, if they are frustrated, they have to think over again, what kind of their actions are inviting this state of international affairs? 
True, exactly. Also, the Indo-Pacific mm -hmm. strategy is created not a hostile block to China, mm -hmm. even open to China, but yes. it depends on China. So the this Indo-Pacific idea initiated by Abe mm -hmm. uh, was greeted by Mr. Trump. Yes. Course, Mr. Trump once uh, looked to pretend that it's his own idea. <laughs> but, Mr. but Mr. Biden is more modest. <laughs> okay. So, Ambassador Hiramasi, actually, we have a lot to learn, a lot to lo know from you. Mm -hmm. So, I think one episode is not enough. So, definitely, we'll be back to you. And uh, yeah. our viewers are, would love to know because these things, actually, we don't get to know every day. It's like what you were telling us. This is a very inside story you are sharing with us. So, you would love to know more and more. So, today, we would love to you know, end here. I don't want to bother anymore. Yeah. So I'll be back to you again with our second yeah. episode. And okay. uh, for the viewers, definitely this is this is kind of um, delight. You you know, this is you don't get to know those things. You are these information. You are these are coming from inside. So definitely, okay. you know, I mean, viewers are. I think they are having party of knowledge. So okay. thank In you so second... much. In the second phase, I'll discuss about uh, uh, what kind of problems India have to overcome first. Secondly, uh, we, I, I would like to discuss Japan-US bilateral relationship. Okay. okay, great. So viewers, we are you already heard what we are going to discuss in our second episode. So for today, okay. we'd like to say thank you so much for watching and we'll be back with ambassador hiravasi next week same time okay. and same platform ambassador hiravasi thank you so much hontoni hontoni arigatou gozaimashita do itashimashite see you again <laughs> and oyasumi nasai namaste namaste subscribe now and press the bell icon Never miss an update.